What's up, guys? Welcome to Winnipeg's Finest, the podcast where we get personal with notable Winnipeggers. If you haven't been with us before, here's what you've missed. Jolly, I love Liz. Liz is a great human. Uh, Roy, you're at that too. Um, Roy's okay. Greedy ass motherfucker is gonna turn that evil. That's no. hands on what happens. Right? Always. 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 You know, nothing kind of offends me more than when I go watch a DJ play an hour of someone else's music the entire show. What is up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of Winnipeg's Finest a podcast where we get personal with notable Winnipeggers. Today's guest is owner of the gym Midtown Barbell and founder of Deadlift for Dreams in partnership with The Dream Factory, Dave Beakley. Dave Beakley is a wonderful guy. He trained me all throughout high school, one of the biggest role models in my life. Today we talk about Deadlift for Dreams at the beginning, then we transition into training people, having an influence on younger people's lives, building cultures, being held accountable, working hard, and making sure that you are impacting other people's lives Throughout your life, not just being a successful athlete or successful at whatever it is you do, making a difference in this world, whether it's right next to you in your backyard or on a grander scale. Today's episode is, of course, brought to you by Jellyfish Float Spa. Jellyfish Float Spa is the greatest place in Winnipeg to do float therapy, which is, of course, you guys know this already. I know you listen to every episode where you lie in a pod filled with 10 inches of water and a thousand Epsom salts. There you release into pure bliss, radiant joy that you cannot get anywhere else. It's wonderful. I go about twice a month. Canon goes twice a month. It's a great time. Jellyfish Float Spa also does massage therapy and craniosacral therapy as well. You get 15% off if you use our code in the description below, Winnipeg's Finest. Just mention you know us. You get 15% off any float there. It's wonderful. 894 St. Mary's is where it's at. Go check it out. And we're also brought to you by Saint. Saint is the best barbershop in Winnipeg, located in the heart of the Exchange District, 75 Albert Street. You can get the freshest cut at Saint possible. Hit up Scott Ramos at Famos, F A M O S, on Instagram. If you screenshot listening to the podcast and show it to one of the barbers, you get $5 off your first cut there. What are you waiting for? Go check that out, ASAP Ferg. And here we are finally in the studio with David Beakley, also known as Beaks. How's it going, man? Good, good. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Uh, Beaks, of course, is in charge of Deadlift for Dreams, a wonderful event being put on at Midtown Barbell on March 30th. Uh, do you want to talk briefly about how that came to be and how that's going to go down? Yeah, the, uh, the Deadlift for Dreams, uh, I had an opportunity to do some work with the Dream Factory and find out what, what they're all about and... In getting to know them a little bit, I had uh, an idea burning in me for a couple of years and wasn't sure how to go about the charity portion of it. Mm-hmm. Getting to know these guys really made me realize that they can take care of that and I can take care of the things I'm good at, which mm-hmm. would be something along the lines of powerlifting. I met with them and, and told them what I wanted to do and what I expected of them, and they were really excited to do it. The Dream Factory makes dreams come true for sick children, and... They're really excited to to do Deadlifts for Dreams because it's unlike anything that they've done before. Yeah, and the, the two coming together has just been an incredible response. Yeah, and you've been doing media like crazy for the past couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to talk or show my face on camera for a couple months after Deadlifts for Dreams. Um, it, it's been a lot. It's been incredible for for the for the fundraiser, and um, I, I've been all over the place the last little bit, and it's it's been really fun. Yeah. Putting it all together. And the proxies, of course, are going to uh, for Maya, right? Yeah, so uh, we, we set a $10,000 goal, uh, which would cover um, paying for Maya's dream. And we're actually, we surpassed 15000 Wow. Uh, this week, yeah. So uh, the Dream Factory, very, very excited. All the extra proceeds are putting together funding for a future dream that they're, mm-hmm. that they're going to do. So it's it, it helps them out a lot. And uh, it's really gotten a lot of steam and I'm already semi-planning for next year. <laughs> That's awesome. So what's going to be there? Like you're going to go to the gym on the 30th. There's going to be people deadlifting. Yeah, we've got 25 competitors. Yeah. Uh, it'll be set up like a full powerlifting meet. So oh, okay. you'll have your, your opener attempt, your second attempt, and your third attempt. And there's going to be judges. There's going to be announcers. Uh, everything will be recorded. It's it's going to be like an actual meet. Wow. Uh, we're just just deadlifts though, instead of a full meet, which would be squat, bench press, and deadlift. 
Are you going to be participating? No, uh, I, I bounced back and forth for a while, and, and truth be told, I'm extremely nervous about making sure the event is top-notch and, and running a good event, and I didn't think I could juggle both. So once I see how this year goes, maybe I'll, uh, I'll prepare and, and do next year. Yeah, for sure. Until then, Casey will probably win, right? Uh, tough to say, actually. Ooh. I mean, Casey's an incredible lifter and, and a very good chance to lift. Uh, the, the formula that we're using will be like a, a body weight times weight kind of uh, formula. So, I mean, Casey's getting up there in, in weight, and um, so that, that may throw it off, but there's also uh, some very, very good lifters, a couple coming from, from down south, and a couple others from out of town that are, are pretty wow. solid lifters, and uh, who, who knows who's going to take it. When did you come up with the idea of this? Like you said you've been working with the Dream Factory for a while. Yeah, the, uh, the idea, um, down, down south, my, my buddies in Minnesota started one called Relentless. And they work with the Children's Wish Foundation, and they do a full meet, and they all the proceeds from that go towards Children's Wish Foundation. They managed to expand from Minnesota to Detroit to Texas, and they, they've been going for a handful of years now. And uh, I've I've always wanted to be involved or to see if we could do it up here. There's different federations with powerlifting that make it hard to juggle bringing in lifters from different federations. Yeah different rules and whatnot. So I wasn't sure how I was going to bring that all together and then doing the charity part. I wasn't, I had no experience in doing that. So teaming up with the Dream Factory took care of that and doing deadlift only and an unsanctioned meet made it a bit more lifter friendly that you can get people from different federations to to all come together and and work together for one dream. Wow. I mean, you've always been involved in the community though. Even way back when I met you in high school, you'd you travel up north to do work out there, right? Yeah, I'm actually leaving Tuesday for a week to oh, go really? to, to Nelson House. And I, I think that's something that was, was put into me back to when I was a Churchill Bulldog in high school. And we would do community events, and, and we'd, we'd work at the Osborne Street Festival, and, and then on with Bisons and, and getting involved in reading programs and anti-bullying programs and, and things like that. It's I think using... Learning to use your platform to help others. Uh, if, if all I ever did was powerlifting and I didn't give back to, to younger lifters and I didn't use powerlifting to enhance other people's lives, I'd end up an old man with a total that no one remembered and a bad back. Uh, this way I, I can do things that carry on long after I ever pick up a barbell. Yeah. I mean, even so, that's... Isn't that kind of what the gym's been about for a while, right? Like, even back when it was McDowell's, you'd be training younger kids for football, for basketball, for whatever sport they come in with. You expanded so well, and now you're in Midtown, you moved a little bit. And you're still doing that. You're still training athletes. Yeah, just finished uh, a group of 15 football players this morning. Uh, They range between 9 and and 13 years old. Just like when you used to train, you'd see the young guys coming in, and uh, you you build people and you build relationships beyond the sport that they're training for. And I mean, I'm sitting here with you, right? Yeah. And it, it's been a good four or five years since I trained you, but you maintain relationships and and hopefully you you say and do some things that steer young men and young women in the right direction for life after basketball and football and hockey. And that direct relationship, I mean, like you said, it carries on. How do you think that, do you think it impacts all the kids the same way? Do, are there some kids that you trained, you're like, I wish I, tr- I acted a little differently, or I wish I trained them a little differently? I certainly do. Um, I know now at 38, I'm a different person than I was at 28, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm a lot more conscious to, to be a better role model, because uh, you, you, you continue talking to some of these, these young men and young women, and I remember when you said this, and I remember when you said that, and like, wow, stuff I said is, Stuff I say really sticks with these people, and I got to make sure that I'm I'm always saying and, and doing the right things because, like, like I said, you're you're in your mid twenties now, and if I if I had been crabby or, or said something crabby to you one day, maybe it stuck with you, and you're like, that's how adults act. So I'm gonna act that way because I looked up to Coach Beeks when he was my strength coach, mm-hmm. and so with with these young young guys, I really make a point to to be very positive and. I try to anyways, some people might disagree, but uh, to try and stay positive and, you know, teach them, like, this this hard work and maybe a coach coming down on you and you're not giving your whole effort, 
that that goes into the classroom and one day you're going to have a job and your, your boss might not be satisfied with the work you're putting in one day and just because he comes down on you for that doesn't mean that he cares about you less or has lowered his as expectations for you. It just means that he knows you're better than what you're giving in mm-hmm. and he wants to get that out of you. Well, I mean, that kind of ties into what we were talking about before we started recording about old and new school, right? Yeah. Like, it's important to remain positive and to be positive all the time. However, that's not the only human emotion. <laughs> yeah, you know what, though? You can be, you can be honest in a certain way that you can get positivity out of it. Yeah, fair. Uh, you know what I mean? You can, you can take it, take any person, an employee, uh, a young kid who's training, and you can come down and be like, you suck, man. You're terrible. They could have sucked at that moment, but you could also approach them in a different manner and be like, hey, man, I've seen you do better than this. Yeah. You, you, can, you can give me more than this. I know you have it in you. Yeah. Same message, just a different delivery. Yeah. And... You know, you can stay positive about it while bringing light to something that's not necessarily positive. Yeah, and like you're saying, right, like it's not necessarily positive and yet the delivery is important. I think saying some, somebody you suck is just being an asshole, right? And that's what I mean. You are, you are being an asshole. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe some people don't know how to communicate that better. And that that sticks with people. You know what I mean? And if, if you hear that, that you suck or you're an asshole enough times you're going to start believing that you suck or you're going to start believing that you're an asshole. Mm -hmm. But if you have someone in your life that cares about you that says, I know you're better than this, next time that you don't want to give your best effort or next time you want to do something that isn't along the rules, you're going to think in your head, you know what, someone believes that I'm I'm better than this and I'm going to show them that they're right. Mm -hmm. You know? Take take you, for example. You weren't the best athlete I ever trained. Really? (laughs) Really. (laughs) Believe it or not. (laughs) But... I, I, I think I, I, I've even brought this up in conversations just recently uh, that I don't know a lot of my athletes that gave me more than you. In terms so, of what? As, as, in terms of effort. Mm. And, and I have one, particularly story, one particular story that sticks out that I'll get to, but we, we could come down and be like, man, Nick, Nick can't jump. Like, why is he playing basketball? Nick, <laughs> Nick you have a terrible <laughs> vertical, Nick. Like, why are you even doing this? You would have stopped playing basketball. But now you have stories about university where you're like, I just don't work guys who are better than me. Yeah. Hopefully, I had a very small part in contributing to your mindset that, like, I'll just outwork people. Totally. And I can get somewhere. With I them. love, like, there was nothing more fun for me than, like, getting on the bus to go to McDowell's and, like, I don't know, work out even though there were, like, hockey players and football players and, like, power lifters there. It was just, like, the funnest thing. Fun's not, funnest isn't a word. It was the best time, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and it really can be. And, and, and the story that I'm thinking about is you just finished a, a terrible conditioning session. We we put you guys in the ground. Oh, yeah. And the football guys came in, and you talk about an example of, of bad attitudes. They just, it was a Saturday morning. They weren't there to work. And we told them what they had to do that day, and they, they pissed and moaned. And you stepped out without us asking to, and you're like, I'll do it. We're like, you just finished this. And you did 10 more prowlers under 10 minutes after doing the workout, and you're like, there, I did it. You guys can do it. I think it was five minutes. I, I, yeah, it might have been five I minutes. I think it was five minutes. It, it, was, it was unbelievable time that most people couldn't do in their first session. And you went and did it a second time. And you were like, there, you guys can do it too. I think it was because the punishment you had for us was way worse. It was like, wasn't it how uh, we were doing relay and each person had to do ten their backs or something or yeah. five suicides. And my team lost. And you're like, okay, losing team's got to go to... Tread sled now, and I just didn't want to do fucking tread sled. <laughs> and that's exactly it. And you, you use motivational tools like that. <laughs> yeah. um, and you, you had every right to walk out of the gym and be like, I wish those guys well. But you, you took a leadership role yeah. without anyone asking you to, and you're like, there, it's doable. It's completely doable. You guys can do it too. Well, what do you think sets kids apart? Do you think that's something that's just inside them, or do you think that's something that you got to get out of them as a trainer? Like, how do you look at that? It's a bit of both. So, some guys have it in them. And mm-hmm. you don't you don't have to poke the bear at all. Uh, other guys, you got to bring the dog out on them a little bit. And if you pay attention to different people, different athletes respond to a different stimulus. Uh, you can you can come down on a guy and challenge him a little bit, and and get it out of him. And other guys, you got to praise them a little bit to get it out of them. Mm-hmm. And if you're a coach that pays attention, you you learn different personalities and and know what to use and when. Like, when you look at something like, I don't, the first thing that popped in my mind when we were talking about 
leadership was Michael Jordan punching Steve Kerr in the face for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and Kerr seemed like the kind of guy that just took it and was like, oh, that's Michael. So, th- that, that was a good example. Uh, he punched Steve Kerr in the face in practice, and they, they continued to get along, and Kerr stepped his game up and was like, I'm not going to be the weak link on the 72-win team. Turn around to the Washington years, and Jordan goes up Kwame Brown one side and down the other side, yeah. and essentially ruined Kwame's career because Kwame just shut down and never realized his full potential. Yeah, and and that's the the same tactic with two different people and two different responses. You know, yeah. but Mike Mike only I don't know personally I call him Mike, but uh, he only knew how to lead one way, mm-hmm. and he's like, I'm going to outwork you. I'm going to tell you I outworked you, and I'm going to let you know when you're not working hard enough. And you get some guys, but but I think that Bulls team was was made up of guys that no one wanted to be the weak link. If you're playing eight minutes or you're playing forty minutes, no one was going to be the guy that when you watch film the next day it was like I slacked there and I slacked there and yeah. I let Phil down and I let Mike down and I let Scotty down. No one wanted to be that guy, mm-hmm. and Mike wouldn't let anyone catch up to him as far as work ethic, so he never let them down either. Totally, and I mean look at the ripple effect. Of Steve Kerr, just specifically. Yeah. Steve Kerr became the GM of the Eight Seconds or Last Sons. Yeah. And now he's the head coach of probably the greatest dynasty of all time. And he's, I will <laughs> I will die on the hill. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and Kerr's at what, nine championships now? In total, yeah. He yeah. won six with the Bulls, and now he's three with Golden State. And, and you, the amount of talent on Golden State, you can't say that there aren't Eagles on that team. And he manages to get them... Who knows what they're like in the locker room? Who knows what they're like after games? But for 48 minutes a night, they get along because the ultimate goal is just winning. Put put it all aside. Let's just win. You'll all get paid if we get win. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, totally. If we get wins, and uh, you know, certainly part of being with the Bulls, Steve Kerr managed to take something from that experience and get these guys to dial in with the same mindset. I mean, yeah, there was a, wasn't there that story that came out a couple of years? I think it was this year or last year coming out about Steve Kerr. The game where Steph Curry hit that shot at the logo to beat the Thunder. Yeah. Draymond yeah. Green pissed him off so much that game. Draymond's like, I thought I was getting traded the next day. Yeah. In a 73-win season. Yeah. Or even the other night where where everyone saw Steve Kerr mouth, I'm sick of Draymond shit. Yeah. That's a heat of the moment thing. And, and Draymond does do a lot of stupid things. But I actually think they're they're fairly tactical. And he's getting under people's skin. Totally. And, and it doesn't always work the way you want. And... Guys like Draymond will piss off coaches. I know I when I when I played football, there there are moments where I'm like I might I might not be starting next time. <laughs> I, I did something dumb, but every, everything I, I did generally I, I had a purpose for doing it. And if you're getting under your receiver skin and you get his mind out of the game and you make the game a bit easier for yourself, the odd fifteen yard penalty here and there, it looks bad. It looks bad on, on film and, and for outside spectators, but that, that 15 yards goes a long way for the rest of the game. Totally. And guys like you and guys like Draymond, like, like you said, it's calculated. They're not stupid. Like, yeah. You don't play college football for however long you did. You don't win a defensive player of the year, win three titles by being in. You don't luck into that. No, ex- exactly. My biggest issue, like my biggest beef with sports narratives is when people look at the Patriots or the Warriors or anybody, any dynasty you can find. Oh man, they're just lucky. Yeah, the thing with that, and I've always felt this way: the the loudest voices uh, that sports fans have are the people who never got off the couch. You know what I mean? And maybe yeah. they saved up their energy to express their opinions, but the ones who play know, and they're normally the ones who are pretty quiet. Mm-hmm. You know, guys like you and I can sit around and play talk basketball from from an educational standpoint because we. I, I mean, I. I didn't play as much basketball as you did and, and a ton of people, but I know the game. And and you see stuff and you know how athletes think and act and, and you can speak from that behalf. But totally. you can see a guy maybe take a longer stride that, that throws someone off of their stride and your casual fan be like, Oh, that was the other night with uh, Zion. Oh, he was trying to trip him and re injure him. No, he's not. You're just trying to get in Zion's head and make him think about his ankle a little bit and yeah. And, you know, change the stride and slow him down for, for getting back on defense. You know, you know, athletes, 999 out of 100 aren't trying to hurt one another. And that because one because we don't want that to happen to us. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. And Draymond's not out there trying to end careers and, and change people's lives. And 
he's just trying to get a win for his team. And and you're if you play the game, you know what it's like. Someone's done it to you. You've done it to someone, and you're just like, I'm just trying to get a dub. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, it's something. Little, I'm the, the only person I'd be skeptical of is Pachulia. He's got a bit of a reputation. <laughs> that, that guy's got videos back to when he was playing on the Bucks, and I'm not sure people yeah. know he played on the Bucks. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> um, and and I mean, sometimes you're compensating for lack of athletic ability, but. Totally. Uh, Pachulia's got a bit of a reputation. <laughs> well, I like what you said, though. You said, like, we can talk basketball. You haven't played as much. Don't, it translates, though. Like, when you played football all through college, you've played your whole life. Like, it, if somebody were to explain a different sport to you and you watched it enough, I'm sure you'd get it. Like, you wouldn't be able to be like, oh, I can break down the X's and O's. But it's like, oh, I can relate it to football, which I've played for the longest time. Yeah. And one thing about me, I'm actually... I, I, like, I love baseball more than I love football and basketball. Really? I love watching baseball. And I, I think from years of playing sports, not being the most athletic guy on the field, I had to compensate by knowing the game inside and out. Yeah. And understand, what are you trying to do to me? Where are you trying to get me to go? And where are you trying to go? And how can I get there before you? Mm-hmm. And so, basketball was more X's and O's instead of me jumping over you, because I can't. So, <laughs> I, I got to find ways to get the job done. Same. And uh, baseball, I think, is the ultimate chess match. And... You know, it's more than just pitch and catch. Like, these guys study film and when do pitchers like to throw certain pitches and what's he trying to set me up for. And I'm going to take this fastball because I know what's coming next. And the big debate this offseason was should they allow the off the, the infield shift? Yeah, allow it. Get better. Yeah. Hit, hit to the other side of the field. Work in the off season to beat that so they can't do that to you. If you got four guys on one side of the infield because you, you hit there so often... Spend your time in the off season getting better and being able to hit anywhere you want in the field. Of course. You know what I mean? Look at Barry Bonds. Everyone knew he was trying to go yard. Stop him. Yeah. <laughs> Just stop him. Literally. You, you, you know what I mean? And uh, you, you can't complain about guys being successful or, or defenses making shifts. You know what I mean? If, if, if you're a, a football offense and you, you run to the right side of the field 90% of the time, so you start doing defensive line shifts, are you going to complain, like, you can't do that? You're going to run left. Yeah, you're you going know to toss I mean? the other way or something. And uh, I, I think sports and coaches and athletes should take that stance of, I'm not going to let you adjust to my strengths, stop me from being strong. I'm going to get better and find a way to beat you. Totally. And I mean, sports, one of the things I love most about sports and what you're saying, like the X's and O's, Sports is like the ultimate game of strategy, which becomes, you know, about physical dominance and athleticism. And I think when you have players like Barry Bonds and Jesus Christ and LeBron James, yeah. like who I've been watching kill the Raptors for a while, <coughs> you know, it forces you to either get better or just be something he runs over on his path to the finals. Yeah. Like when the Raptors in game one last year, when the Raptors lost because they missed 900 tip shots at the rim. Yeah. And they just didn't show up for game two and three. You're like, man, this this is a team of losers. Yeah. This is completely a team of losers. Got to make strategy changes. Like, okay, what are we going to do to stop them? Yeah, exactly. And I, and I mean, I'll, I'll go further back to, to the late 80s with Jordan and the Pistons. Mm-hmm. They're like, he wants to come in the key. We're going to foul him every time until he stops. Yeah. And foul him again and foul him again. We got 15 guys with five fouls each. That's 75 fouls. And we're going to use them all on Jordan. Yeah. And... He could have folded, or he's like, now i got a fadeaway. Now i got a jump shot. Well, now he, I'm trusting my, my shooters. Yeah. And you're like, well, we're, I guess, six championships later. We <laughs> know, we, you know what I mean? Yeah. But he was so athletically dominant that the Pistons were just like, slow him down. Clothesline him, choke him, grab him, pull him. And it, and it worked for two, three years. Mm-hmm. And that shows an athlete's mindset of, if you're doing this, I can just keep letting you do this and keep losing and have my incredible regular seasons, or I want to be a champion. I want to be the best ever. I'm, I, I changed my game. Totally. And mm-hmm. you know what I mean? People didn't adjust in time. And, and you take someone like LeBron, uh, and this is a, now I'm getting into like the nerdy X's and O's side. Yeah. Make him a three point shooter. Totally. And he, he young, young career, he wasn't, he's still not great, but young career, he wasn't, he didn't have that range. But teams were still covering him at 20 feet, at 22 feet. And you're like, just make the man shoot jump shots. He wants his buckets. He's going to force a couple ones up eventually. 
Get the rebound and go score. You're up four points. They lost two, you got two. You're up. That's a four point swing. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're still trying to man them up with a power forward who's too slow or a guard who's too small. You know what I mean? Yeah. Have your wing player just sag off. Yeah. My biggest issue with, and I'll get back to the Jordan thing quickly, my biggest issue was when the Raptors played the Cavs in 2016 and Damari Carroll, bless his soul, after two knee surgeries on the same knee in, like, less than a calendar year, every time LeBron would get the ball, he'd close out and just, like, be all up in his jersey. I'm like, dude, you do not have the leg strength yeah. to compete with Tayshaun Prince right now at age 40. Yeah. Back the hell off. And he just got that, what was that one where he, like, dunked a hole in the ball after he spun off Carroll baseline and just slammed it down? I don't remember that one. It was, like, the snapshot of him dunking and there was like a dent in the ball when it hit the rim so I don't there. think I ever saw that oh no it was great can you pull that up real quick and uh yeah it was just Mario Carroll uh LeBron James dunk dent in the ball it was nuts because Carroll was just like LeBron had the ball in the corner and Carroll was like all up in his jersey and LeBron just spun off him yeah well there's just there's, there's no need for stuff like that if, if you know who you're playing and that's ego getting in the way of like I'm still the guy I used to be and, and I'm gonna Show that I can do this totally, and he could. When you were the Hawks, he could do that. Yeah. He was, had great angles. He was agile. He could check guys like that. He's yeah. long. Not after two surgeries. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. But going back to Jordan, like you said, like they beat the shit out of him, and he had to add weight. Like he was skinny. Yeah. So he and Tim Grover got together, and they're like, "Look, you're gonna put on five pounds every summer. Because yeah. if you put on more than five, it'll be bad for you because you'll lose some of your athleticism, and you might get hurt." Yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah, and that's. I mean. He did a great job with Jordan, and he gets a lot of credit for that. And you you do things slow and steady, and, and put that on. It, it's going to make a big, big difference. Same with Kobe. You yeah. Look, if you look at a rookie picture of Kobe. Oh my goodness. He literally puts a dent in the ball. We're just looking at the pick right now, and there <laughs> literally is a dent in the ball. Yeah, that was after he spun off. <laughs> that's, tough. that's anger. That's, that's coming. Like, don't don't do this to me anymore. <laughs> um, Zion had a good one the other day where he grabbed a rebound. And there's a picture of him squeezing the ball, and there's a dent in the ball. And you're like, man, you've got to flex that hard. Like, just get the rebound. <laughs> just grab it and run. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, like, uh, who was it? Ben Simmons. Remember when he was on the Sixers? His rookie year, and they got him to put on 35 pounds in an offseason? Yeah. Then he broke his foot? Yeah. Yeah, as, as an athlete and the speed that they play at, I think a lot of people, you watch it on TV and you watch it up close and live, or if you're lucky enough like me, you get to work with them. It's a whole nother level. And when you're sitting on your couch and you're like, you know, why, why did the DB do this? Why did he fall for that? Because it happens in the blink of an eye. And uh, when you're moving that fast, if you throw on, on weight too fast, knees, hips, ankles take a beating. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you can't do it that fast. Totally. Yeah. And like, like you said, you got to build things. Actually... Something you said to me in grade 10, you said anything built slowly, had, like if you build a solid foundation, then you can actually start to build your strength and your athleticism. Yeah. Anything gained quickly is lost quickly. Yep. Uh, I, I still stand by that. Um, I use that a lot with diet, uh, but you know, training falls on the same thing. If you, if you hop on one of these fad diets and you're drinking your keto tea and walking around with a bag of bacon and you're like, I do keto and I lost 20 pounds in a month. You're going to stop one day, and that's coming back. But if you're like, I'm going to take this year, and I'm, I'm going to change my lifestyle, mm -hmm. this is something I can sustain. Mm -hmm. So when I'm, when I'm not eating this way 100% strict, I can maintain my new body weight. Uh, same thing with training. If you go in and, and you've, you've got all your gadgets and your special tools and, and this and that, and, and you, you're, you've got a crazy calorie surplus... Sure, that's great for one off season, but what about the season when you're traveling and you're not training like that? Like it, it's not something that you can you can maintain that long. And uh, one thing, one of the earliest things I learned from when I was an athlete under Chris McDowell is you you approach training like a pyramid. And you know, if we're playing Jenga right now, we had Jenga blocks here. If I put three blocks on the table and we want to pile it as high as possible. It'll only go so high before it falls over because it has a really small foundation. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a race to get to the finish, you'll, you'll only go so so far and then it'll topple. But if I'm like, look, I'm in this for the long run and we're going to make this base 
fifty blocks wide. Yeah. And the next one's forty nine. And the next one, and and then now we're gonna have a, a, a Jenga tower as tall as your house. Yeah. And you gotta approach training athletes the same way. And I've got some some twelve, thirteen year olds right now. They're like, I want to squat. I want I want to deadlift. I want I want to do these big lifts that I see my my heroes on TV do. You can't do. Take your pick. Take your your NFL player right now. Philip Rivers. <laughs> so, someone more athletic. Somebody who could squat probably. Uh, Melvin Gordon there. Take Melvin Gordon. You can't be 13 and do what Melvin Gordon does today. Yeah. You, what did Melvin Gordon do when he was 13 it is what's important. Yeah. And what did he do when he was 15? And what did he do to finish high school? And what did he do in university? <coughs> Those are his base. Yeah. That makes him Melvin Gordon today. Uh, you, you can't just walk into a gym and... And you've been a bag of milk your whole life, and, and you're like, I want to do what, what Ronnie Coleman did, or what, what Kai Green, and I want to look like him. You're going to get hurt. I want to deadlift like Dan Green. You're going to get hurt if you walk in the gym day one and you're doing Dan Green's program, what he's doing right now. Yeah. Because you, you don't have the, the build to do it yet. You can work your way to that, but you've got to be willing to start at the start. You can't start in the middle or the end. Yeah. You know? And I'm sure a lot of that stuff, when you're first working on, it's body weight stuff, right? Ton, tons of it. And, and people are shockingly poor at body weight stuff. Totally. You can have a four or five bench, and you can do 20 push-ups. You don't weigh 405 pounds, but you're, there's just little things like that. The amount of people who look fantastic and have incredible lifts that can't do proper chin-ups. You know, and, and you build those body weight things and, and learn how to work with your body. Uh, you'll all your other big lifts will, will improve so much more. Dude, that drove, I remember when I first started working out with you, that just drove me nuts. I'd see like grade 12 kids come in and like bench and do weights and I was still doing push-ups with like that wooden block and the cushion on it. <laughs> we still do that. Like. We still have the same block. <laughs> and and I'm sure the, the kids that we, we work with now are frustrated and they're working with Brody Williams. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Brody's a physical specimen and he's strong as an ox and these kids get all pied when they see him finish training before they get in. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure in the back of their mind or, or even their parents looking over the wall at the front like, well, why are my kids doing what Brody's doing? Yeah. Like, Brody has the secret sauce, and they're giving my kid Superstore brand. Why Why are they doing what he's doing? But Brody did what they did when he was their age. 100%. Yeah, Brody started when he was nine. Brody did push-ups when he was nine. And push and pull the sled when he was nine. Chin-up holds. Those, oh, those are my least favorite thing ever. I still hate them. You gotta <laughs> do them, though. The worst. And, uh... Yeah, and it's hard to... I mean, kids see everything through the eye of a needle. So it's hard to, to get them to understand... Um, and, and even sometimes parents, it's hard to get them to understand because they want the best for their kid. Mm-hmm. And if, if you haven't been exposed to training, you, you don't fully get like the development and the progression yeah. of it all. Yeah. Wall sits in outs with squat holds, yeah. planks, ISO holds. Yeah. Do you know, oh, those drove me nuts, man. Yeah. I mean, take planks. <laughs> if I haven't done them for a long time and, and if I neglect one thing, it's, it's core strength. If I go back to doing planks after a few months of not doing them, a minute is tough. Yeah. It gets better quick, but that first week, you're like, wow, I really let myself go. Like, I'm, I'm shaking. Like, I'm having tremors doing a minute plank. It shouldn't be this hard. But you, you neglect those little things, and the big things fall apart. Yeah. No. Uh, actually, when I was in high school, when I transferred in my grade 12 year, one of my friends, Middle, middle of the, like middle of the season, he told me something that I've never heard of before. So props to you guys for doing a good job. He was like, yeah, man, I can't believe it, but I lost all my gains. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> he was like, yeah, man, like I gained 20 pounds this summer. I just lost it. And I was so mind-fucked. I was like, that can happen? <laughs> yeah. Like, how are you training? He's like, oh, I haven't really worked out before. And I just started this summer. Yeah. And that just blew my mind in 10 different ways. Yeah, and it, it, it's hard and... and you, you try to, especially with young kids, uh, you, you got to talk to them. Like, they want to, or, or, I mean, I work with a lot of power lifters, and you get people that are new to the sport, mm-hmm. and they want to they wanna buy the gear, and they want to lift heavy all the time. They think, like, I'm a power lifter. I just do one rep max every week, and I, I, I try to blow that out of the water every week, and, and I want to take supplements, and I want to buy every supplement on the shelf. I want to open my own Popeye's, so I always have 
creatine and BCAAs and whey and isolate and blah, blah, blah. Just learn how to lift. Mm. Start at the beginning. Learn how to lift. We are all born. We all learn to sit. And then we learn to scoot on our ass. And we learn to crawl. And we learn to walk. And we learn to run. We didn't come out of the womb running. You, you got to start from the beginning. And everything in life is that way. You don't apply at a company, your first job ever, and your CEO of Google. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You got to eat shit for a while. Totally. Uh, we, we just talked about it with the podcast, with you guys. Mm-hmm. You don't start a podcast and have sponsors and tens of thousands of listeners. Mm-hmm. You, you got to open and be like, thanks for listening to my podcast, mom. Join in next week. <laughs> Yeah, and exactly. Next week, your mom and your aunt listen. My, my mom doesn't even listen. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and I hope my mom doesn't. Um, but you, you, you gotta start, and you gotta get your feet wet, and you gotta eat, eat a little bit of shit at the beginning. It, it's like being a rookie on a team. Carry bags. Next year, you don't have to carry them, but carry them this year, and learn how to be a pro. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I got to high school. And grade 10, and I was the best Greendale Falcon the past year. That doesn't matter when you get to high school. No. And then I was a pretty decent high school player, and I got to university, and it didn't matter how good I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And you had to carry bags, and you had to, you know, sit in the crappy part of the locker room, and you had to have better players forget your name. And you can either take that and get better and become the best that you can be, or you can tuck your tail and go, whatever, go play intramurals. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? And, uh, again, I don't know how we got on this topic, but I think that's the, the, the value that I find in sports and that I try to pass on uh, to young athletes is that it's a life lesson. Sports is a life lesson. You, you guys both played. Mm-hmm. And if I work hard to get better, I'll be rewarded. Yeah. And if I work hard in school, I'll get better grades. And if I get better grades, I'll get a better job. And I get a better job, I'll go there and I'll work my ass off and I'll climb the ladder. But I got to start at the bottom and work my way up. Totally. You you know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. and the carryover is so close and I think so many people overlook it. You just want to be the man in, take basketball, you guys basketball players. I want, to be, I want to be the man in basketball, and my whole life is basketball, and everything I do is basketball, and I only identify as a basketball player. If you don't understand what basketball is doing for you, and you don't develop yourself at more as a human being, mm-hmm. one day basketball ends. Life continues. And if you didn't carry anything with you to continue your life, you really wasted that 10 years that you played basketball. Yeah. Because when, when you're my age... Literally, no one cares what I did in football. Most people I know don't even know I played football. I can't be like, oh, man, in 1998, I had two interceptions against Tech Vock, and I returned a kick for a touchdown. That didn't really happen. I'm just giving an example. <laughs> but no one cares. I'm 38 years old. Why are you telling those stories? Yeah. Tell me whose life you made better. Tell me the business that you developed. Tell me the podcast that you grew into a 1,000 listeners from none. You know, I mean, Tell me about stuff right now. Then tell me how the stuff from before developed you into the person that could do that. Yeah, because the stuff from before, it matters to a certain point, right? Like, if I have a friend who's super loyal to me and we love each other and we're great friends and they do me dirty once, it's like, oh, you know, it's out of, it seems out of character. Yeah. But once that behavior starts to change and to know you're just an asshole, yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. Yeah, no, <laughs> exactly. And, and generally, those are the people... That are unhappy with the life that they're currently living, and they want to make you equally unhappy with the life that you're living, mm-hmm. where you're like, yo, I'm doing good things. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I'm passionate about, and I'm sharing it with others, and you're just being a crab in the bucket trying to pull me back down to your level. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Actually, going back to the bags thing quickly, I remember when I was in grade nine, there was a trainer who used to work at McDowell's. And he left, for, I'm not going to say his name, I'm sure, he, I'm not sure if you remember or not, but he left for whatever reason, and you told me, he's like, I, he, uh... <laughs> I know where this is going already, and, and the odd thing is, I talked about him today. Really? And I had to bite my tongue while this, this other gentleman talked about him, but he shared the same sentiment you're about to share. Yeah, and you told me, he's like, look, he kind of wanted too much too quickly, and you said the exact same thing, you're like, when you're a rookie... 
you got to hold some guys' bags. Like, you think LeBron showed up in the league and Drew Gooden and Larry Hughes were like, yeah, man, LeBron, like, please save our team. They're like, man, no, you got to earn this shit. Yeah, yeah. And, and same thing, anything gained quickly is lost quickly. Mm-hmm. Same thing is, is respect is earned. It's not given. If you, if you show up every day with your lunch pail and you put in an honest day's work, people will respect you and the best things in life are going to start happening to you. It might not happen on your timeline, but they're going to happen to you eventually if you keep that mindset. Mm-hmm. Totally. And do you, do you think that, like, back to what we were talking about before recording about, like, the Michael Rappaport calls it the skinny genification. My Paul Pierce calls it the Instagramification. I've never heard that, but that is so funny to me. That's great. Rappaport's great. Rappaport's yeah. hilarious. Do yeah. you think the new school idea of... Here, I'll say this, actually, because I wasn't sure I was going to... Participation trophy culture. Do you think that's kind of becoming too big? I 100% think it's due. It, like, um, I'm going to sound like a crabby old coach now because I, I came came from, you know, there's one MVP on the team. You're the best player. Yeah. You know, but now it's like, well, you had the coolest shoes and you tucked your jersey in every game and uh, you showed up to every practice and uh, your mom made us cookies and everyone gets a trophy and... <laughs> And you, you get a trophy, and you, you guys were last in the league, but you played eight games, so here's your trophy. And you're like, no, just reward people for doing well. Because, again, when sports ends, you go to a job, and your boss isn't going to pat you on the back every single day. He's not going to come by and, and Nick, you, you, were, you were awesome today, and I'm super happy to have you if you weren't awesome. No. And he's not happy to have you. And I, I think we're we're currently raising a culture of kids that expect that. And you know, you you hang your head and, and trip over your lip on the way out when you're like, Well, coach didn't tell me I did awesome today and maybe I'm gonna quit or maybe I'm gonna transfer and mm-hmm. I always laugh when, when you see these NCAA guys transfer schools because uh, you know, my coach doesn't like me. Your coach doesn't care about you enough to like or dislike you. Mm-hmm. Your coach cares about his contract and winning and having a job next year to put food on his family's table. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, <coughs> and that was the culture I grew up in. Totally. Where I, I'm a very, like, I'll show you kind of person. Same. And uh, if you think I can't, I'm going to find a way to do it. And if I don't get to the point where I do it, I've bettered myself trying. Mm-hmm. And um, I actually, um, I, I was talking about someone, and I'm, I've, I've got a million dreams and different things that I'd like to get to have on the go. And, and my girlfriend told me, you can't save the world. But what if I try? What if every day I try to do something? What if this year we did Maya's dream? What if next year I do three dreams? What if the year after it's in three provinces? That's not the world, but I've reached out to 15 kids, 20 kids, and I made a memory for their lifetime that's going to last forever. And I made their parents happy. Like, someone out there that doesn't know my child really went out of their way preparing something that, that brought them to Disneyland. They're, they're terminally ill, and they got to go to Disneyland before they did that, and their little sister got to go with them. Yeah. That's... So don't don't challenge me because you're you're gonna be wrong. And I, you know, even if I don't do what you said I can't do, good things happened along the way. I'll do something else that's badass. Like yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. But yeah, like you said, what if you change? What if you make three dreams come true and then it's in across the country? Yeah, and then somebody in the states picks off your idea, and now you've influenced somebody else and somebody in Europe, like. Yeah, you don't know where it goes. Yeah, so take take Delos for dreams. Uh, my good friend Ben Thompson in Thunder Bay. Uh, he couldn't make it out because uh, he's doing awesome things and he's going to Australia to compete for for strongman. But he did a fundraiser that raised fifteen hundred dollars for Maya's dream. Yeah, what if that gave him a feeling like I can do this too? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's not that's not me doing work. But that, that that falls under, you know, I, I influenced Ben to, to do this, and now that carries on. And then he's going to have someone, and it's a trickle-down effect. 
And it, it's nothing but positive things, trying to do positive things for others. Yeah, and that ripple effect's huge, right? Like, yeah. I guess it kind of ties into what you were saying in the beginning, like how you how you train your athletes and the difference that you make. Like, how many times have I quoted you right now on this show? I think I've quoted you like three or four times from <laughs> things you've told me. <laughs> yeah, and, and then that, that, sorry to interrupt you, but that goes yeah. back to me at 38 now being a lot more aware of what I say to people. Yeah. Because I only want them going out and maybe maybe you just, you can't get your math in your grade four class. Like, you just don't get it. I'm going to give up. No, you know what? Coach Beeks believes in me. And I'm, I'm going to come back. And I'm like, Coach, I got 17 out of 30 on this math test, and that's the best I ever got. Yeah. That's not an incredible grade, but if that's the best you ever got, that is incredible. Because yeah. you got better, and you didn't quit. And you, you put pencil to paper, and you put the time in, and you got better. And you developed that. You, you got rewarded by putting in that work. So you're going to continue to work, and you're going to show someone else to work. Yeah, and that's worth celebrating. Like, exactly. Just because, talking about participation in trophy culture, just because the coach doesn't say he likes you every day doesn't mean that the work's not worth putting in. Like, Yeah, I'm sure there are workouts that you left feeling accomplished, and I got on to my next group of people, or I had to deal with someone at the front, and I didn't get a chance to catch you on the way out Yeah, and tell you that you did awesome. Yeah. It happens. And, you know, and, and everyone needs a little pat on the back now and again. Mm-hmm. But you didn't let that deter you from knowing that you you had a, a job well done that day. Hell no. You know what I mean? I actually, I remember the first time, because I, I love basketball and I love training and stuff, but the first time I remembered that I'm like, yeah, I want to keep working out of this gym when I was in grade nine, I think it was Chris told me, he's like, yeah, he's like, you're a project man, don't worry, we, we love having you at the gym, we want you to be a good player, and yeah, keep coming here. Yeah. And that made me feel so damn good, I'm like, wow, like these guys actually like me. Yeah, because I work hard and because I'm curious and I ask questions. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we we always did love you. Like this is now we'll trade jerseys after the podcast or something. <laughs> but we always did love having you there because you just you were a sponge mm-hmm. and whatever we gave you, you did to get better. And you get some people out there that that focus on. Well, I got these three provincial guys and. Uh, you know, Nick's not a provincial player, so we'll let him work with them, but we're really going to pay attention to these other guys. Mm-hmm. Well, why not spend as much attention on the kid that is there to work his tail off and and help him? Maybe he gets to their level. Yeah. Maybe you do more for him than you did for them. They're already at that level. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, whether whether you're the the best player in, the, in, in practice or the best lifter in the gym or the worst, you deserve the same attention. You're there. You showed up. Mm-hmm. And your job as a leader, a coach, a boss is to make – you're in the front because you're a leader. Mm-hmm. And you're the leader as, as your role as a leader is to make everyone better. Yeah. And the better the squad gets, the better you look. So you win either way. Yeah. You know? Who knows? What if those provincial kids see a less talented kid working hard and like, oh, shit, he's coming for me. <laughs> yeah. I got to get – I got to ramp it up. Yeah. And like when I was, when I was competing – and uh, I see Casey getting better. I'm like, man, this is going to... Or, or Jordan Hanna. I'm like, damn it. I got to step my game up. Like, I, I don't want these young cats to come, come in and take, take my throne. You know what yeah. I mean? And it made me work better and everyone got better. It made me work harder and everyone got better. And mm-hmm. everybody wins that way. You know? Yeah. I remember once when, uh, when I was in grade 9 or 10, I got cut from this club team. And they were working on McDole's. And you're like, hey, man, they're coming in tomorrow, Saturday to work out. I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm not coming in tomorrow. You're like, no, no, but you should come work out with them. Yeah. I'm like, but I'm not on that club team. You're like, yeah, but it's my gym. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's funny. I, I remember that actually, and I remember that team, and, and, and that's it. And, and that's an opportunity for, for you to be like, you you missed out on this. Mm-hmm. And, and you got a, a good character guy and a good hardworking guy. Mm-hmm. And while Superstar over there is, you know, he, he banged his pinky on a, on a bit of turf, and he's going to sit out the surprisingly the hard work and not the fun work. This kid's over here sweating his bag off, and you know people take notice of that kind of stuff. And you know when I when I played Bison's, uh, I took every opportunity to. I knew I wasn't going to play in the CFL, mm-hmm. so how can I use what I'm doing now to make my life better mm-hmm. in the future? So you work hard and you take a good leadership role 
Maybe you meet someone that likes your work ethic and is going to give you a higher paying job than you deserve one day because they know you're going to go to bat for them every single day. Yeah. Or when I met Chris McDowell, there were better guys on my team training in our group and I just wanted to, to work my ass off. And Chris let me stick around and clean dumbbells and clean toilets. And there was a trainer there. And I knew everything. I watched everything he did. And I knew when he was lazy and when he wasn't. And when he wasn't working hard, I worked twice as hard. And I didn't have to be like, hey, Chris, check me out. I'm moving the dumbbells. Yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm vacuuming. He saw. Mm-hmm. He knew. And you know what I mean? Now, now I own a gym. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because of the opportunity that Chris afforded me because I worked my ass off. Yeah. And I think that's something that's lost a little bit today. And maybe... But that comes back to the participation thing. You get a pat on the back for everything you do good. What's the incentive to work harder? Yeah, that's true. You're going to get a pat on the back either way, so... If if all three of us are somewhere and you guys are outworking me and I get the same recognition that you do, I go home feeling satisfied. But if, if we're all there doing something and you guys get rewarded with whatever the reward is, and I leave a little bit pissed off, I calculate how do I get what they have. Yeah. You know? Uh, or one of the lessons that I learned very young, um, you get better by playing against better people. So I could have, I could have, you know, shot hoops at St. Germain Park with whoever was there, and, and I was one of the best players. Or I could bust down to the YMCA downtown against guys seven years older than me, and wait my turn to get on the court, get my ass busted for two, three hours, and slowly get better, yeah. and get better, and get better, and eat a little bit of humble pie till you go back to your own peer group, and they're like, damn, where did you come from? How did you get this good? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, I just put in work. You totally. know what I mean? I just kept going, and I put in work. I, uh, I can't remember where I heard this from, but... I think maybe I heard it on Joe Rogan, maybe not, but, uh... Just say, just quote me. Say I said yeah, that. it was Beaks, yeah. <laughs> uh, you should never be the funniest or smartest or most talented person in any room. Otherwise, you're doing yourself a disservice. I agree. I, I actually, I wrote an article about this years back, um, and it's a saying I heard when I was, I was younger. You're the average of the five people you hang yes. around the most. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you hang around five shitty people you might be the shittiest one. Mm-hmm. But if you surround yourself with, what do you desire in life? Do you want to be better at, at a skill? Do you want to be, do you want to have the sickest podcast? Do you want to be the strongest? Do you want to be the wealthiest? Mm-hmm. If I want to be a millionaire and I'm hanging around with people who are living in debt, yeah. I'm not going to learn how to be a millionaire. So surround yourself with a better peer group and they'll bring you up if you're willing to do the work to get to where they are. Totally. And that's just something that's human nature, right? Like you pick up on so many things subconsciously. You yeah, accidentally, I, I've got my foster kids and the nine year old, sometimes I hear him talk and I'm like, I didn't teach him that, mm-hmm. but he watches me and yeah. he listens to me. And you're like, I'm, I'm making a, a little version of me and hopefully in the long run, a better version of me. Yeah. And it just, you, you accidentally pick up things from people good and bad. And, and again, as a leader, you, you become aware of that. You, you try to make sure you're on your best behavior when people are around, yeah. you know, when you're alone, you can cry and punch walls and make sure no one sees that. <laughs> and then when you're back in public, you, you can, you can go back to, I mean, I always think stay real and, and give people an honest opinion, but, uh, you, you go back to being like, I'm, I'm a proper role model for the people around yeah. me and it's shocking. You know, when I was in my, my twenties and, and I was a strength coach 40 year old men who looked up to me in a way yeah. was intimidating. She's like, man, I'm trying to learn from you. <laughs> but they're, they're picking stuff up from you and you're like, I can be an example for everyone around me. I can go to the grocery store and the woman at, at checkout can be a little bit crabby and I can say something nice to make her day and it can change her mood for the person behind me. And it can change a whole line of people mm-hmm. just by me being like, hey, Thank you very much for your time today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Mm-hmm. She's kind of the person behind me, and he's kind of back to her. And the person behind him sees that. Now you got twenty people in this line that are going to see a happier woman, yeah, or a happier checkout person. And and you can do that anywhere in life, and it costs you nothing. Yeah, that's so true. And I think, like, when uh, oh my god, I just completely blanked on what I was going to say. Good, I'll interrupt you. When you open, <laughs> it, you, when you open the door today. Yeah. You had the biggest smile on your face. 
and instantly I'm like, man, today's gonna be dope. <laughs> like Nick, Nick is ready to do this. Now I'm ready to do this. I got goosebumps right now. Yeah. Like we're gonna have a wicked podcast. We're yeah. gonna talk about some awesome stuff. I'm gonna see an old friend, uh-huh. and like this is gonna be wicked. If you were dragging your feet, you're like, sup, Dave? Fucking uh, car didn't start this morning. We're gonna sit down here and we'd get through an hour of of formulate crap, and we'd leave, and then you guys would post it because you gotta post something. Mm-hmm. And just be like, man, we did, we did not do ourselves a service. Yeah, yeah. You you bring your energy, and people feel that, and 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 you give off vibes, and and you you create the the people around you. You you create that vibe with your own energy. Yeah, yeah. I, I ran up the stairs honestly when I heard that doorbell. <laughs> he did. It took so long. It's not that quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, five years of McDonald's could not change that. Of course, <laughs> as hard as we tried, damn it, Nick. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh. I remember that one drill that we had where uh, it was 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off with a medicine ball above our heads, defensive oh, sliding, yeah. back and forth, jumping when we got to yeah. the end. That still gives me PTSD, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a burner, that one. Your, your shoulders don't want to hold that med ball anymore. Your quads are burning. And, and again, it's just intestinal fortitude. Am I going to keep this, this med ball above my head or am I going to like cheat when coach isn't looking to hold it at my, te- my, my chest? You know yeah. what I mean? Am I going to stand up whenever I get a little break? And uh, stuff like that. Time stuff for me is funny because you, you can't mentally put yourself together for 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. 30 seconds. I'll list you 100 things I can do for 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And uh, people that, that quit with, with that is just shocking. And, and you wonder what their outside life is like where you're like, either push through or fail. But don't quit. Yeah. Failure is okay if you gave gave everything that you had in you failure is okay it happens sometimes mm-hmm. there's stuff that you're just not ready to do yeah. if you decide you're done if you're halfway through a rep and you have the energy to be like no 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 no, take it you had the energy to push that five more inches yeah you know what i mean yeah like if you're doing that drill and you fall over because you can't get up yeah and you're reaching for the ball <laughs> you're still trying to get up, but your legs are just like, no, we're not doing this. Yeah. That's one thing. But yeah. if you're like, oh, you know what, Casey, I really don't want to do this. And that's actually something I wanted to bring up really quickly because you guys did a good job of, other than the trainer that I had who left, you know, the trainers that you brought in were basically like Chris and Beek's disciples. Like Casey was a dope trainer. Yeah, I love Casey, Casey. Casey was great. Um, and again, we, we, do a lot of hiring from within Mm -hmm. because it's guys that understand the culture that we want to provide in our building. And the same thing with Brody. Mm -hmm. She's Brody. Like you see Brody and I together and he's like a younger, more athletic version of me. And then you hear us talk and people are like, if they, if they had their back turned, they'd be like, is Dave talking to himself? (laughs) You know what I mean? But we, we raise these guys and we spent, I've spent 12 years with Brody. Mm Mm-hmm. Of course he's going to be a lot like me. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I spend a lot of, I spent a lot of one-on-one time with Casey. And you, you want to talk about a guy, he was a throw-in at the beginning with these two brothers that trained us. And one of them was a football prodigy, one of them was his older brother. And Casey, we, we called the third brother. And he was like a 270-pound, 14-year-old, not athletic. Mm-hmm. And he just decided, I'm, I'm going to get better. I'm sick of hearing about these two brothers. I'm going to get better. And he went from 270 to 170. And he'll probably text me whenever this is posted and give me the exact weight. But the kid literally lost 100 pounds. Then decided, I'm going to get as strong as I can possibly be. Mm-hmm. And and he's a world-class powerlifter now. Totally. And it didn't happen by accident. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's the culture that we raise. And that's what made him such a good coach because he knew what he is capable of when he was working with limited skill set. Yeah. But he built it up and he built it up. And and he could coach people. This shit works cuz I did it. Mm-hmm. I didn't read this in a book and not train. I worked my ass off and now I'm giving you the same tools to get better or or decide to not get better. Yeah. Once I was uh being a jackass when Casey Casey was training me. And I was like, Casey, I've done deadlifts with like with the trap bar for the past three weeks, and I was like, oh wow, bueno, it's almost like we have systems that we want to see how you guys work <laughs> in and progressively get better in them before moving on. Wow, I never would have thought. Yeah, his sarcasm <laughs> might be a bad trait that he picked up from me, and that's something that I've spent the last couple <laughs> of years working on because 
I was always quick with a comeback, and even though they're funny in real time, sometimes you can uh, <laughs> develop things like that. And again, if you don't deliver it to the right audience, you're a guy that would take it and be like, yeah, okay, I get what you're saying. Um, but yeah, he he was he's always quick with like a, a snarky, sarcastic comeback, totally. and he still is. That's uh, That was one of the things my teammates in Ontario, when I went to Durham, said about me. They're like, man, you're so sarcastic. What the hell's wrong with you? To be, to be fair, though, they asked me dumbass questions all the time. <laughs> like, Some like, of the shit you told me, like, man. Like, w- when coach was like, hey, guys, uh, we might be ordering team socks. And then uh, one of my teammates like, what am I going to do with team socks, man? Put them on my feet? And that was just the dumbest thing I ever heard. So I was like, no, you're going to put them on your hands. <laughs> I went to uh, a spring camp with the Calgary Dinos one year. And uh, great program. The coaching staff there was great. Team team was really good, and I just realized right away I don't fit in mm-hmm. because you, I'm I'm a very sarcastic person, and I I conduct myself the same wherever I am. And these mm-hmm. guys would look at me like I'm the idiot because I'd I'd say something very dry but sarcastic, mm-hmm. and it would go over their heads. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, this this just isn't a good fit for me. Yeah, you, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you got you got to be careful where you use it sometimes. But sometimes people just say stupid shit. Hey man, stupid questions deserve stupid answers. Yeah, exactly. But then again, there's no such thing as stupid questions. Only stupid people, right? You know, I say there's no such thing as a stupid question unless you ask it twice. The first time you get a pass because maybe, a- maybe I explained it wrong. <laughs> Uh, may- maybe I explained it too deeply for your understanding, mm-hmm. but the second time you ask it means that you didn't listen, and now it's a stupid question. Yeah, that's a good point. Now you should know. Like now you should know what I'm about to say. I gave you the tools to know better. Exactly. You didn't use them. Exactly. So now it's stupid. You know what? When I I remember I forgot what I was going to say earlier about rep, like people who you're with and how their behaviors rub off on you. Uh, I never complained to referees. I used to when I was in grade 10 and 11, and I just thought, this is wasting my time. This is stupid. I don't want to do this because, like, I'm never going to be like, man, come on, you got to give me that call. And they'll be like, you know what? You were right. I'm going to change the call now. No referee in the history of sports has ever done that. Yeah, ever. So I'm just like, you know what? If a ref called a foul on me, I'd be like, oh, was that on me? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, okay. And sometimes I ask them, be like, was it because my feet were moving? They're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, thank you. Yeah. And when I was at Durham, I noticed after a bad call would happen, I'd start to get up on my feet and, like, get animated and I didn't realize why then after a while I look over my teammates and my coaches and my coach told the ref once that he was like a terrible person and they'd just be like berating the dude and telling like telling him off and telling me sucked and they tell us yo guys don't talk to the referees yeah so yo man do what I say not what I do to the fly yeah no exactly and that's that's again building culture as a leader you can't tell people to do one thing and not be willing to do it yourself and every leader whether it's coaches or strength coaches, or teachers, um, bosses. If you want to build a culture, you have to be that culture. Mm-hmm. Because it will follow if that's what you really are. If you want to build another culture, then allow your players to be the same culture that you are. Because they're going to follow your lead. They choose you as their leader, mm-hmm. and they're going to do as you say. You know, And, and culture is a big thing. And you know, maybe maybe Jerome didn't fit your culture. God, no. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I, I think that's a big thing for, for players looking at teams. You know, you're, you want to play for this team or that team because they're, they're recognized. And I want to I go play for Duke because it, it's Duke. But if that culture doesn't suit you, you won't flourish there. Mm-hmm. you got to find the right fit for you. That's why you find guys that go to small schools – make good pros. Tom Brady isn't a patriot. He's not the same Tom Brady that we know today. Totally. But the culture on that team and the systems on that team suited what Tom Brady needed to be successful. Duncan as well. Tim Duncan, same thing. Um, quietly a very funny guy, highly intelligent. But if, if he was on on the, the Pistons team that won a championship, that wouldn't have suited him. Because that's not how he, he played on the court. Mm. Even those Pistons teams, man. You but know, they had their own culture. Yeah, yeah. Just separate from San Antonio's culture. They had their own culture. They had a very good them. culture. And that that's why Rashid was so successful there. Because other teams, when he was with the Jailblazers, that was such a poisonous <laughs> yeah. culture that they allowed each other to be poisonous because they are all poisonous together. They just enabled each other. When he went to Detroit, 
you had Chauncey, who was a great leader. Mm-hmm. She, who was a great personality. Ben Wallace, who was a very hard worker. Tayshawn, who was very quiet. Um, and, and again, would just lead by example. And Rip Hamilton. Rip was another quiet guy. Guys that all knew their roles and, and fit into the, the culture of that team where we're like, we just work hard. We play super hard defense. We're fine with a 78-70 game. No mm-hmm. one wanted to be the 30-point scorer. Which everyone wants to be, but no one had to be. Mm-hmm. Rip wasn't like, hey guys, y'all play defense, and I'm going to run off some screens and get my shots. Yeah, Make sure I get my shots. No one had that on that team. And if Rip was off, Chauncey would get buckets. And if Chauncey's off, then maybe they're feeding Sheed on, on, on the post or in the wing, depending on those matchups. But they, they fit into the culture of that team where everyone believed in each other equally mm-hmm. and worked equally hard. Yeah. You know? And if they weren't scoring, Ben Wallace was cleaning it up. <laughs> and that's, yeah, exactly. And, and you look at a lot of teams uh, where it's not always addition by addition. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'm curious how Le'Veon Bell is going to do in New Jersey because you're not just taking on the running back. You're taking on the person. Mm-hmm. And that can be bad for a locker room. And if Antonio Brown doesn't have the right attitude in in Oakland now, it'll be Las Vegas, but if he doesn't have the right attitude with that team, it can make them even worse than they were last year. Yeah. You're like, how can you get worse by adding one of the best receivers in the game? Because he made the team as people worse. Yeah. You know? And you, you look at that, uh, again, in hiring, in business, you might have a guy that has a 4.0 GPA and has all the accolades and has experience, mm-hmm. but if he comes in and he's smarter than the boss... And he likes to gossip with other employees. Mm-hmm. Let him go. You know he's not bigger than the business. He's not bigger than the team. Let him go. Totally. And, and find someone who's going to come in and 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 fit in with the team and make everyone better. Yeah. And you know what? Tying in being a role model and training and culture all together. Do you know who's a ball boy for that 04 Pistons team? Not just 04, but that <laughs> that uh, that team that won the title. Like, I know this, and I can't. Who is it? I'll give you a hint. He went to Michigan State. Draymond? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Draymond was a ball boy you know for that team. I mean? And he's an embodiment of those guys. He plays. Yeah, like, he could have played on that team. Totally. Yeah. He would yeah, he would have fit in well on that. On that on you that, know what yeah. I mean? You could you could pull out Ben or Sheed and, and put Draymond in, in that system and they would have had the same success. And like look at him, he's another one of those guys that wasn't super athletic. He was what, a kind of a fat kid coming out of college four years. Yeah. He's six seven. He's not a power forward. He's not really. He's not quick enough to be a small forward though. Mm-hmm. And now he's a center. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen the video of him playing tight end for Michigan State? No. He went to a spring camp game, and just looked so out of place. Really, like DBs who are 190 pounds pushing him around and getting him off his route. It's super funny. Weird. Yeah, really. it's terrible. And <laughs> it's just funny to see a guy carry over to another sport and be like, wow, you are very basketball specific. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and he fits in perfectly with the Warriors. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. And uh, well, when Oklahoma let Harden go, I said at the time it was the bad move. Mm-hmm. I agree. Because he was a chemistry guy. Mm-hmm. And he, even though he still puts up gaudy numbers, he's still a team guy. Yeah. It's crazy because he, like their ISO with him is so far beyond any other team in the NBA. Mm-hmm. But he's still a good character guy. And you could have played him with Westbrook. Yeah. Or you could have let Westbrook go and played him with Durant. And I think they would have been better they would have been better off keeping all three, even if he's not scoring like he was scoring, because he just fit in with them so well. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's why they uh, that's one of the reasons why Durant left. He said that OKC enabled Westbrook. Yeah. And I, I they really, still do. I really don't like Westbrook because I think he embodies that I'm better than you. I'm cu- How do I put this well, well? So you'll know what I'm talking about right away. Playing for looks rather than playing for yourself. Or playing because you love the game. Like people, What's the one thing people say about Westbrook? Oh, he plays hard. You know he's a dog. Is he though? Like, Can you watch him on defense and sometimes he falls asleep? He's guarding Steph. The game that Steph Curry hit that shot from the logo for the win, Steph hit 12 threes or 11 threes or something ridiculous yeah. over 10. Yeah. There were so many possessions. Westbrook closed out with his hands down on defense. Mm-hmm. Even like in his triple double season, like he did specifically like played off of the three point line and not play defense just so he can get grab rebounds and get steals and stuff like that. 2017, the player who contested the least amount of jump shots with a minimum, I think, a certain amount of minutes played, Westbrook. You know who was second last of contested 
jumpers outside of the free throw line? DeAndre Jordan. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. I read that same article. I remember that. That's crazy. Like, oh, that's that's not an embodiment of hard work then. Now you're just being selective so you can jack 30 shots on offense. Yeah, yeah you just want that triple-double. You just want that accolade. Like, yeah. now that he has the MVP, it's like, I, I, I don't think he deserves it. Like, there's no there's no reason he deserves anything more than that. I mean, I, I don't even think he deserved that. I still think Harden should have got it that year. Like, yeah. There's so many, I, and I just read it, and, and you know I'm a big Kobe guy. I'm yeah, yeah. I'm a big Kobe guy. Uh, the years that he didn't get MVP, when back-to-back Nash years. Mm-hmm. Jerk. Uh, and the yeah. Dirk year, and you're just like, it hurts me that Kobe doesn't have three or four MVPs. Um, but it's not just about numbers. Because you take Nash off those Phoenix teams, you don't you don't have the eight seconds or less offense. You know what I mean? And and I hate saying that because, again, I'm like, I'd, I'd rather Kobe had, had those beside his name when the, the old yeah. GOAT debate comes up. And I, I hate the word GOAT, but... Yeah. Because um, everyone's a GOAT. And like, you guys are the GOAT podcast, and... Thank you. Better than Denzel. Yeah, and everyone. Yeah, I hate that Denzel. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we do too. You can say it. It's fine. <laughs> say it. He lives in Transcona. It's not like he's going to hear us. <laughs> just need a re- they even have internet in Transcona. Yeah, I, he goes to the gym to use Wi Fi and post this. <laughs> but, um. He's <laughs> in the corner of his laptop. Oh, Denzel, no, get no. out of the squat rack. One second. Yeah, one more. One more minute. Good Wi Fi spot here. <laughs> um. But. But yeah, there's being most valuable, being most valuable to to whatever you are. There's, there's more than just numbers, and totally. uh, you, you could have taken Kobe off those teams, and they wouldn't have been as good, or they wouldn't have been championship teams, but they still would have been playoff teams. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, you take Nash off the, off that team, and all the chemistry is gone. Yeah, you know. And I think the Dirk one. It's just nice to see Dirk get it. Totally <laughs> tough to tough to call him an MVP. Uh, he, he's not super well rounded as a, as a player. Mm-hmm. Uh, he plays within his skill set very very well. But um, Kobe should have got it that year. But yeah. it, it is nice that that Dirk can ride off into the sunset whenever he does, and at least have, he's got a chip and he's got an MVP. Yeah. So it's ah, nice to see. I love Dirk. Yeah, and uh, the We Believe Warriors upset them. But I mean, Kane, what do we do? That team time? was dope. <laughs> the We Believe team. <laughs> oh, that team was so dope. Baron bro. Davis, Steven Jackson. Yeah, I love Baron. Yeah. Who else on that team? Andres Biedrins? I was just going to say Biedrins. You stole my next one. <laughs> uh, Richardson. Jason, Jason Richardson. Richardson. Jay Rich. And who's their power yeah. forward? Um, was it Danny Fortson? <laughs> that was the... Yeah, that was, was it? Da- Danny Fortson was there. Danny Fortson, really quickly, before I ask for the time. Danny Fortson was rated an 87 in NBA 2K2 on the Dreamcast. That's incredible. Dreamcast basketball was so dope. Never I loved it. Dreamcast. Right over there. Nice. You guys still play that? <laughs> totally. That's wicked. I used to steal. We didn't have internet in my house. Yeah. Like, my family was late getting internet. Mm-hmm. And I had my Dreamcast. And I stole my bread. My buddies, U of M. U of M used to, like, give out X amount of hours of internet. Mm-hmm. And my buddies, like, just used mine. And uh, I used to, like, log in on my Dreamcast to, to browse the web and, and use his, like, U of M password to get like 20 hours of internet each month because he had it at home. It was so ghetto, but <laughs> you got to do. You got you to exactly. do what you got to do to get what you want. Yeah. We're out here hustling, man. You Grinding. People exactly. don't even know. Okay, Kane, what are we doing for time? Hour 10. Hour 10. How do you feel about things? I'm good, man. I'm happy. I could sit here and talk all day. Yeah, me too. Unfortunately, kane has got work. How long, Kane? Uh, in 20 minutes. 20 in 20? Yeah. Dang. So, got to wrap it up. Sorry, yeah. but... Yeah. Okay, right. Beaks, anything you want to say before you leave? Plug, anything? Um, who's ever listening, if you check out deadliftsfordreams.ca, um, go to the website, still the donations coming in are, are going to, to future dreams, mm-hmm. even though we reached our goal, you, you never stop there and you keep striving for more and, mm-hmm. and, and $5 donations, $10 donations, small, small donations, every little bit counts. And, uh, if you can check it out, even if you don't donate, read my story and, uh, get to know why we're doing this and you'll, you'll, you'll definitely be touched. Yeah, totally. And uh, Beeks, thank you so much for uh, being on here again. This is a pleasure. Well, yeah, I appreciate you guys for time. It was good to see both of you guys yeah, again. It was awesome. Way too long for Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Feels weird to hear you refer to yourself as Dave. Uh, I know the the Beeks thing is dying off, and I think really, that, that, I think it's coming with age. Where uh, less people when I was like Prince, and I almost didn't have a first name. It was just Beeks. 
less people in my life know me from that that time, and it's it's just Dave now and an old dog. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Just like uh, the Bueno No Bueno thing came from uh, Chris. You, you know what's funny? Uh, bueno No Bueno and uh, Ghost Case Killer. Yeah. <laughs> and Tegan Hortons, which I can't remember what his handle is. All came from Jim's stuff. Yeah. And you guys just kept that the whole time, and that, that's all your social media names. And I, and I just, I smile every time I see it, because I'm like, there's a little bit of me in that, that Instagram yeah. name. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll actually tell the story before we sign off really quickly. I remember it was, uh, I was doing incline dumbbell chest press with 10-pound <laughs> weights. I remember that I, I, I can picture it right now. I know where you're going with And this. I was doing it mid-press, and Chris just comes over. He goes, hey, Nick. I'm like, what? He's like, did you ask me bueno? I'm like, yeah. He's like, how come you never told me that? I'm like, I, I, I didn't think it was important. <laughs> He's like, your name's bueno no bueno. And I was like dying. It was like the end of my yeah. set. I was like, okay. And every time we failed on something, we would say bueno, no bueno. <laughs> All right, this is us signing off on Winnipeg's Finest, guys. Have a great week. Peace out. Talk to you later, guys.